For my story before Christ, I was uh, born and raised um, LDS, Mormon, um, come from you know four generations of, of background, born and raised in Utah. So it was all I knew growing up. Uh, Mormonism is a is a um, a faith that is based on your works. Uh, in other words, uh, by keeping the commandments, you earn your way to heaven. And so that's what I uh, grew up with. I, I went all the way through, um, you know, all the all the teaching, Sunday school and primary and. Uh, seminary, early morning seminary, all those things teaching me about Mormonism and I never really looked outside of Mormonism. Uh, I just trusted that what I was being told by my parents and my leaders and all those people I knew was true. And so I tried to rely on that. I knew that even if I had gone astray or men had gone astray, that if we just followed what we called the gospel, um, that that it would lead us to truth and we would end up in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom and so that was our goal. Um, the, I, I guess if the, the way I could express the best of what it felt like is that I was constantly under scrutiny. Uh, we were constantly being looked at to determine our worthiness, uh, whether you could go to the temple, whether you could go on a mission, um, and I did all of those things. Now, the worthiness factor is, is something that's quite interesting because, um, like all men, I'm a sinner. And yet, in Mormonism, where the goal is to become perfect and to become godlike, then any f uh, failings uh, would be considered a sin and we, we wouldn't want to display those. So, it's always about looking good. It's about uh, acting like we're keeping all of the commandments and, and being good people and that's how we related with each other all the time. Very rarely would you um, confess any any sins or any doubts or, or anything like that. It just wasn't really acceptable. And so, um, so I raised my family that way. We were, I raised four children in the church. I served a full-time mission. We were married in the temple. I always had teaching and, and working responsibilities within that church and there was always this desire, this need that we had to be perfect in order to, uh, or at least striving for perfection. So if you do that uh, your whole life there's, there's going to be a, a lot of pressure and um, we never thought of ourselves as sinners, we just thought we repented so fast that our sins didn't really matter, I guess. But what, uh, what happened was eventually um, I had been investing, I had, been, I had done very well financially, and I had been um, investing in the stock market and in um, the late 90s and 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst, we lost a lot of money. We had been involved with uh, several trading clubs that I had been running and so we lost a lot of money, not only our own money but other people. Uh, I had felt a, a, a tremendous amount of responsibility for that and, and so I, I didn't, I mean this is a lot of money. So it's not like I could go get a job at McDonald's and, and earn the money back. But someone approached me with the idea that I could buy some cars out in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that had been confiscated by the police is what I was told. And so uh, I loaded up, I went out there. There were a few times when the, the deal sounded too good to be true, but at the same time there was a significant cost. that We needed to come up with about $80,000 in cash, not about exactly 80000 in cash. I had 40, two of my friends had 20. We put that money together and I headed off to buy these cars. And our goal was we were going to sell these. Uh, we were going to buy these cars at a huge discount, bring them back to Arizona, sell them, and make a profit. So I, I get out there, and um, things start to go bad. We get out to the the warehouse where the cars are supposed to be, and as we pull into the loading dock, I felt someone grab me by the collar and pull me back, and I heard click, and there's a gun at the back of my head, and <clears throat> I. Um, Needless to say, I was scared. At that moment, the $80,000 in cash didn't mean anything to me. Um, I was more concerned about my life. And these guys came, they, they got me out of the car, they duct taped my arms behind my back and they had me on my knees and then got behind me 
and put the gun at the back of my head. And when they did that, I knew they were gonna kill me. I could identify them. So I knew I was, I was dead. And I was, uh, I just was trying to figure out what that would be like. You know, am I gonna be with God? Am I gonna be, um, you know, where am I gonna, am I gonna feel this? Is it gonna hurt when the bullet goes through my head? And, but the big question was, am I gonna be with God? And in my Mormon, training, my Mormon mind, I knew the answer was no. Because I hadn't kept all the commandments. I hadn't done everything I was supposed to, and I, and I did a whole lot of stuff that I wasn't supposed to. So I was a sinner like everybody else, but I'd never really contemplated my sin. And at that moment, I knew because of my sin that if this man pulled the trigger, I was not going to be with God. Um, so. I started praying quietly in my mind, please don't let this man kill me. And um, at length they came, they stood me up and they walked me over by a loading dock and they laid me down. And at first I thought they were just going to let me go, but they duct taped my legs and then this guy, uh, his name was Dirty by the way, he climbed on my back and <clears throat> with, my duck, with my legs duct taped and my arms. And, He's kneeling on my back and he's putting the gun under my shoulder. I'm waving my arms. He put the gun against my head and he's trying to figure out, you know, where to put the gun to pull the trigger. And I just started praying, um, you know, Heavenly Father, please don't let this man kill me. And a, a voice came into my head as loud as anything I've ever heard that said, you put yourself in this position, you made decisions that I tried to warn you through the spirit that you know, you shouldn't be here, and yet you ignored me, and because of greed, you put yourself in this position. If this man chooses to kill you, I can't do anything about it. He has his agency. That's the God that I understood and worshiped in Mormonism. And, but at that moment, I shoved all of that aside, and I just said the most sincere prayer I had ever said up to that point, and it was just, Heavenly Father, please don't let this man kill me. And at that moment, this this guy leans down, and uh, you know he, he literally he's he's a gangster. He's got dreadlocks. He's got a a big chain and 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 a great big gun. And he leans down and he whispered in my ear, "Tonight, I bless you with your life." And then he walked over by his friends and he said, you know, hey, what are we doing? We need to blow these guys away. And his friend said, no, we've, we've got to get out of here. And so they took off, left me without the keys to my rental. Um, but so that left me broken. And I couldn't understand really what it was, why I was so broken. I think the violation of being robbed, losing the money was a big part of it, but there was something so much deeper that I couldn't explain and it had to do with that fact that I knew that if I died, I wouldn't be with God. And I knew that it was because of my own doing. I knew that I had displeased God. And I knew, but what I instinctively somehow knew is that me trying to, um, uh, trying to keep the commandments and trying to live the Mormon religion was not getting me closer to God. It wasn't, it wasn't going to help me achieve some sort of great reward in heaven. And so it left me really broken. And I never doubted the church, I just doubted my ability to keep all the commandments. And I was in a broken state like that for about six and a half years. And. Um, and then one day my daughter asked me a question about Mormon history. Uh, in, it, it had to do with polygamy. And I thought I understood the subject really well. But when I went to the internet to prove that I knew what I was talking about, I discovered that, um, that I didn't understand everything that is available to understand about uh, plural marriage and, and the Mormon church. And, it kind of opened uh, the door for me to start doing research. And as I researched, I found a whole world of, of really credible insert, uh, uh, research that would refute many of the things that had been taught. And, uh, but I was in this broken state and I just felt so separated from God. I just felt like if I died now, my wife would go to heaven and, and I wouldn't be with her. Um, so. I was in this broken state for a long time, but after a while my integrity 
kind of grabbed a hold of me and said, you know, you're acting like you believe something that you don't and you can't do that anymore. And so I did a lot of research uh, that led me to understand that, that the Mormon church was not everything that it claimed to be. And so one night, very late, or actually early morning, I shared that with Maria. And I thought I was gonna lose her. I really did think that if I told her I didn't believe in Mormonism, that she might divorce me or leave me. Uh, but in God's wisdom, he had been working in her and she has a, a great story too, but he had been working in her on her time scale and he brought us together at the same time that as I shared with her what I had been studying, she just said, we need to leave. And I said, well, you know, we could just go inactive. We just stop going to church or whatever, nobody would notice. And she said, Brian, if it's not true, then you need to leave. And, and, I, and so we agreed. And so that started a journey out of Mormonism. And it took us a while, but eventually we started, I started trying to do research because even though, um, even though we realized that what we had been believing was not biblical or um, not in any sense what the rest of the world would understand as true Christianity, I didn't understand what that was. And so we were just kind of floundering looking, but but I still knew that I had had experience with, with God throughout my life. And I felt like that meant something, that he was there, but, but I was just following the wrong path. I'd been climbing the ladder of worthiness, trying to become worthy enough to reach him, kind of my own little Tower of Babel, you know? And I discovered my ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. So, um, after about six and a half years of really struggling and then six months of study, uh, my wife and I made the decision to leave the Mormon church and we started looking around and on the internet I ran across some VBS information. I didn't know what VBS was, but it was a little Bible study and it was geared towards our understanding of salvation and what Christ did. And it just taught us from the very beginning, from the very basics of who Jesus Christ is and we began to realize that that the gospel of Jesus Christ was a person it was the person of Jesus Christ it's not a religion it's not a, a whole social network that we had lived in but the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that he came and died for our sins when I came to understand that um, I had seen altar calls before and I always felt like it was foolishness and uh, because the idea that you could just call out to God and confess your sins before him, um, that, you, that that would uh, bring about your salvation. And yet that's exactly what God has told us that we need to do. But we have to believe in our hearts. And that, that's the believing part. Uh, but at that point in my life, I finally, I was down in Silver Bell. I was driving home one day and I finally had that conversation with God and uh, I, I guess all I could tell you is that the prayer that I prayed that day was every bit as sincere as the moment I had a gun at the back of my head when I was crying for my life and God gave me my life I believe God saved me on that day years and years ago and I didn't understand why and then when I I drove home that day and I just laid my life before him and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a savior and I promise that I'll follow you for the rest of my life. My life changed at that and I, the brokenness that I'd felt for six and a half, just about seven years was immediately taken away. Um, the healing that took place in me uh, was nothing less miraculous than escaping a, a bullet and um, it gave me my, inter my eternal life. And so that's where my wife and I are, are now securely in the hands of the Lord. You know, the, the interesting thing about <clears throat> baby Christians is that when they first know the Lord, when they first come to love Him and understand Him, we're on fire, you know? We can't get enough. And what happens over time is that we kind of settled into our Christian life and we see how other people are, are living and, <clears throat> and we kind of 
I think Paul talks about your first love, returning to your first love, right? Of, of Jesus. Uh, we, we tend to take him for granted sometimes. And at times we start to doubt. And uh, so I would say uh, for anybody who is doubting their testimony, that you need to understand that doubts are good. You know, we're given a critical mind so we can think. But doubt is not the same thing as faith, right? Faith is, is the evidence of things hoped for and the substance of things not seen or the other way around. It's, but it's substance and it's evidence. It's, it's the proof of something that is true, that is not perceived by everybody. But spiritually, you can perceive those truths and you can understand the difference between hopes and doubts and faith. Um, we, we, as Christians, all have faith. We put our trust in the Lord, but we can be tried. That, that can be tested. Um, so I heard, a, I, I'm gonna tell a real quick story and we can cut it out if we need to, but. I, I heard this story, uh, I think John Corson tells it, uh, about a duck who loses its uh, companion. It got ran over by a snowmobile. And the duck um, adopts instead a mailbox as its companion. And every day it's out there by the mailbox and it, it, it uh, sits there all day long. And when the mailman or anybody comes to get mail out of the box, he, the duck goes into a into a frenzy and attacks them and tries to protect this mail box. And eventually the duck dies. Well, so often people are like that duck. And what they do is they, they, uh, they become infatuated with the world. You know, they're, whether it be sexual attraction or materialism or adventures and uh, you know, but they place their hearts in the things of this world. And what they find out at the end of their life is that anything less than God is just a mailbox. And the point I'm trying to make is that so often we confuse life with God. And it's not the same thing. Life is what we're going through, what we experience. God is our home. That's where we're going. Um, I hate to get emotional here, but um, three years ago I was diagnosed with, with uh, terminal prostate cancer. And God has sustained me through all of this, but there have been times where I've wondered where he was. And I know everybody goes through that, that they sometimes just wonder where God is when my life is so messed up, when I'm struggling with so many things, and it could be anything in your life, but life is not God. Life is what we're experiencing now. God is our home, and he says what he's gonna do is polish us. I, I love what Paul says, I think it's in Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter five, where he's talking about our home, and we're tempted in this home, and we long for something else. It's that God-shaped hole in our heart. We're longing for something else. Um, and too often we're looking to the world to find that something else, when in reality, God is right there. He's with us. He is pleading for us to communicate with him. But what happens when we doubt is we stop talking we stop communicating. And then we wonder where God is. He's where he's always been. He's right there with you. He's right there. And all we need to do is recognize that this is not our home. That the glories that await us are so incredible. Paul says that I count the sufferings of this life to not even be worthy to compare with the glorious life that God is going to work in us, meaning that what God is doing 
through this life is shaping us and drawing us towards him so man if you're if you're doubting just recognize that this world is full of reasons to doubt but god will answer all those doubts if we put our trust in him and in him alone he is worthy to take care of our needs does that mean we're we're going to live a, a life of peace and no turmoil and financially we're going to be well off and all of those things the answer is probably not because in those situations we don't turn to God if you feel like you're being stressed that's the time that God really wants you to turn to him because he is the only thing that can fill that that hole in your heart